Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Chris Peniston for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, I gave a, a similar presentation back in January of this year as part of the Caribou Arctics Forum. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, those of you who are attending the annual meeting, there's something valuable in here for you. So um, just by way of introduction, uh, who am I? Well, I'm a basic scientist. I'm a cell biologist and biochemist by training. I have interests in the fibroproliferative remodeling in the bladder um, in the context of outlet obstruction. In terms of my experience and my qualifications to give this particular presentation, uh, well, I've submitted many grants over the last 15 or so years. Some were funded first time or after resubmission, some were never funded. I've had five successful resubmissions of both R01s and R21s. And so um, with that as a background, uh, I think I can certainly talk about the process of revising and resubmitting a grant. I've also served as a grant reviewer, uh, both of R01s, R21s, and I am a former chair of the NIDDK Fellowship Review Panel, uh, which reviewed F31s, 32s, and K awards. So I've seen this process from both sides of the fence, both as a grant writer and submitter, as well as a grant reviewer. So um, I think it's helpful just to review the typical grant submission and review timeline for those of you who are perhaps new to this process. Generally speaking, you're going to spend anywhere from three to six months preparing your grant for submission. Most institutions will request that they see the grant at least two weeks before the deadline. And once the grant has been submitted to the funding agency, it takes about a month. Uh, certainly if we're talking about the NIH, the grant will go through a process of receipt and referral and through that uh, process, it will be assigned to a scientific review group, uh, also known as a study section. After about uh, another three to four months, the grant will undergo so-called merit review. And the role of the study section is to only review the scientific merit of the application. Study sections do not make funding decisions per se, although obviously their enthusiasm for the application will have a strong bearing on whether the grant may or may not receive a fundable score. There are essentially two outcomes at the study section. Either the grant is not discussed or it is discussed. If it's discussed, it will receive a fundable score and then move forward to the second level of review, uh, the council review, after another period of time. And at that point, the decision will be made whether or not the grant will actually be funded. There is a mechanism in the study section to rescue a grant that is not discussed, although this is relatively rare. And what you can see here is that um, there are many paths to being not funded. So if your grant was not discussed, it is not going to be funded. It could be discussed and scored, but not receive a score that is fundable. And then um, very occasionally at the level of the council review, uh, grants do not move forward to funding. And so what this means is that uh, in many cases, you will be faced with the decision to revise and resubmit your grant, and you start this process all over again. And so that's really going to be the basis of uh, the presentation. So in terms of grant outcomes, there are several. First, if your grant is unscored or not discussed, um, commiserations. This has happened to every person who's ever submitted a grant. If your grant is scored, um, you deserve congratulations because getting it scored means it was in the top half of the grants reviewed in that panel. If your score is in the fundable range, even better, uh, you deserve uh, huge congratulations. And this means your grant stands a very high chance of being funded. 
However, the reality is that in any given review panel, only a fraction of grants will ultimately move to funding. And so revising and resubmitting is likely to be a common occurrence in your career. One note, uh, just to protect your sanity, I will wait until there's a summary statement, i.e. the review comments available until I check the score of the grant, because I want all of the uh, potential pain in one go, um, each to their own. I know people who are on ERA Commons within hours of the study section meeting concluding, um, but I find that this uh, is a way to uh, preserve my mental health. So if your grant is unscored or beyond the fundable range, you're going to have to make some decisions. The first thing to do once you get your summary statement is to read the comments and then put the summary statement away for at least a week and process it emotionally. Disappointment, anger, frustration, these are all normal initial reactions to comments that individuals receive from reviewers. So live with that, uh, those emotions, let them play out, and then return to the grant with a clear head in the next few weeks to address the following question. What is the fastest route to funding? So is it indeed revising and resubmitting your original proposal or would submitting a new proposal be a more practical approach? So to help you make this decision, it's important to read and reread the summary statement and do this several times. One practical suggestion is to make a grid of the overall and the criterion scores for each reviewer. And this will allow you to see the uh, criteria that really drove the scores uh, overall. For each reviewer, you can compile a list of the score driving weaknesses by each of the scored criteria, and then stratify those weaknesses as either major, moderate, or minor. And reviewers, good reviewers particularly, will often specify uh, the, the weight that they attach to each of these weaknesses. It's really important that you share your summary statement with uh, co-investigators who might be on the proposal, with your mentors and with other individuals in your program or beyond, and particularly with people who've actually gone through this process themselves. Then you need to brainstorm and decide if and how each weakness could be addressed in a tangible, concrete fashion. It's often worthwhile contacting your program officer and their information will be displayed on the top of your summary statement. If your grant was discussed, the program officer may share feedback from the review meeting since they are often in the room. They do not participate in the review, but they can hear the discussion and they may be able to give you a, a distillation of the overall sentiment of the panel as your grant was being discussed. If your grant was not discussed, the program officer, based on years of experience, can often help you read between the lines and really help you determine what was it about your proposal that the reviewers really didn't like. So with all of this information at hand, you have to decide whether a resubmission is actually worthwhile. If you can easily address all of the comments, then that's probably the faster route to potentially getting the grant scored and hopefully funded. If the key issues are easily addressable, then uh, plan a resubmission. But if the key issues are really fundamental um, and focus on a central component of your proposal, then it may be easier to go back to the drawing board and plan a new grant. I've included this URL here um, from the NIAID at NIH, and they uh, provide a lot of practical information 
about what to do if your application is not funded. So let's think for a moment about the top reasons why grants fail to either be scored or reach the funding pay line. And I've color coded these to uh, illustrate some sense of how serious these are and how challenging it may or may not be to address them. So a major reason grants are not funded is that they aren't question that they're addressing is not significant. So the, the problem or the question is not important. It is the um, opinion of the reviewers that addressing this question will only advance the field incrementally and will really not make a uh, major impact. Um, it will not be paradigm shifting. A potentially fixable reason uh, that grants are not uh, funded is the investigative team. So it does not possess the necessary expertise to carry out the study. Innovation may be a problem, that the solution, the methodology uh, it, it, that you're going to take to address the problem under consideration is not novel. The approach implementation is lacking or inappropriate. The approach may be underdeveloped. It might be overambitious, or you may have written the grant with uh, the full expectation that everything you do and propose will actually work first time. And um, as experimentalists, we know that this is generally not the case. So you have failed to include contingency plans if things don't proceed as planned. There may be concerns about your environment, that you have insufficient resources at your disposal to complete the proposed studies effectively. It's possible that the work that you are proposing is not in line with the mission of the funding agency, although hopefully um, this is something that would be apparent before you ever submit the grant. Very occasionally there is a concern that your proposal was not reviewed in the correct study section, although I would argue this is a relatively rare reason that the grant does not receive a fundable score. Perhaps more common, the application was poorly written or poorly presented, um, and this is a very easy criticism for a reviewer to make. For career development awards in particular, one major reason grants receive lower scores is that the career development plan is underdeveloped. And the last reason that grants are not funded is that your application scored well, but it simply didn't reach the pay line. Just for context, NIH pay lines range from the ninth to the 18th percentile for R01 applications. And so if you do the arithmetic, that means that um, close to 80% of grants are not reaching the pay line and they may score quite well. Similarly for K awards and R21s, um, impact scores of less than or equal to 30 are generally required to position your application within or close to the pay line. And so the reality of all of this is that most grants are actually not funded at any given time. And that brings us to uh, this point of having to revise and resubmit. So how do you fix the problems um, in your resubmitted proposal? So if significance was deemed a reason for not uh, receiving a fundable score, this is quite hard to fix without really overhauling the proposal. And so this would suggest that you should go back to the drawing board and start again. If there were concerns raised about the investigative team, this is potentially fixable um, by adding investigators with the necessary expertise. You can increase the number of personnel if um, the amount of effort committed is deemed insufficient. You add collaborators or co-investigators with the necessary expertise and 
you should ensure that the productivity of the investigative team is appropriate for the career stage. Again, for career development awards or early career investigators, reviewers are instructed to be uh, more generous in terms of low productivity. Um, so this should be uh, tailored to the type of grant that you're applying for. Innovation is also potentially fixable. Uh, make sure that you are using state-of-the-art, current methodology, but importantly, you have to balance that with the fact that your approaches are feasible. Um, reviewers are generally risk averse. And so if you come in with a technology or a methodology that is cutting edge, but really hasn't been validated widely in the field, um, that raises other concerns and you may be, uh, you may receive negative comments that the approach is not feasible. So you have to strike a balance between cutting edge and state of the art, but feasible in terms of your innovation. In terms of the approach, you should make sure that your experiments test the central hypothesis. Make sure the methods that you are using are appropriate and feasible. You want to avoid incremental advances. And ideally, uh, aim for mechanistic versus descriptive approaches, certainly in the basic and translational realm. You should add new preliminary data, and that can illustrate often feasibility with the technique, as well as uh, underscoring your central hypothesis and rationale. You should include a discussion of predicted outcomes and their implications. It's really insufficient to simply say that you, um, everything that you predict is going to be true. You need to interpret the findings um, in light of your central hypothesis and whether indeed you generate data that supports or disproves your hypothesis. It's really important to address pitfalls and alternatives. Grant reviewers are uh, researchers themselves and they know for uh, specific techniques and approaches where the pitfalls are going to lie. And if you don't address those effectively, um, they will criticize you uh, for potentially a lack of feasibility. If you're doing clinical research, it's really important that you convey to your reviewers that your accrual targets can be met, that you have access to the appropriate patient population, Otherwise, again, you will be criticized for a lack of feasibility. In terms of your environment, it's really important to present your environment effectively in the grant. It's not enough to say that you're at a top-notch institution. You have to go beyond um, the, the bricks and mortar effectively. Be specific about how your environment enriches the science you do not simply to state that you're at a great place. And again, if you are performing patient-oriented research, consider how your environment is going to support that endeavor. And that speaks really to the points I raised on the previous slide, that you have access to the relevant patient population and that you see sufficient patients to ensure that you're going to meet um, any accrual targets that you indicate. Dr. Adam, can you hear us? Yes. Um, can I have you wrap it up um, kind of quickly We're going to, in the interest of staying on time? Okay, yep. Sorry um, about that. <laughs> sure. And then the last point is relates to clarity and confusion. Um, if you find yourself reviewing the summary statement and saying, well, the reviewers simply didn't get it, then that is on you. And uh, you need to make sure that the key aspects of your idea come through clearly. You need to anticipate and counter potential reviewer criticisms and uh, be prefer prepared to justify every claim that you make in your proposal. The one piece of advice that I uh, received is that you have to treat your grant application like a one-sided debate with the reviewer. So you have to anticipate and counter the reviewer criticisms before they occur. And then lastly, help the reader understand your logic. Uh, one final point about career development award proposals, 
these often uh, fall down in terms of underdevelopment of the career development plan. There should be a clear acquisition of new skills, either practical skills, workshops, formal coursework or a degree program. And it's very clear to convey how the activities will advance your career and position you for independence at the conclusion of your award. It's also important to establish milestones for specific accomplishments. So um, that's what I have for you today. Um, I will be happy to share the slide deck. There are some uh, practical uh, illustrations of some of the points that I raised here about uh, score grids and dealing with the uh, response to reviewers. So I'm happy to share the slides and this was all covered in the Arctics Forum in January. Okay, thank you.